Essay 5 of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Behavior. Grace, beauty, and caprice build this golden portal. Graceful women, chosen men, dazzle every mortal. Their sweet and lofty continents, his enchanting food. He need not go to them, their forms beset his solitude. He looketh seldom in their face. His eyes explore the ground. The green grass is a looking glass, whereon their traits are found. Little he says to them, so dances his heart in his breast. Their tranquil mien bereaveth him of wit, words, and rest. Too weak to win, too fond to shun, the tyrants of his doom. The much deceived endymium slips behind a tomb. The soul which animates nature is not less significantly published in the figure, movement, and gestures of animated bodies than in its last vehicle of articulate speech. The silent, subtle language is manners, not what, but how. Life expresses. A statue has no tongue, and needs none. Good tableau do not need declamation. Nature tells every secret once. Yes, but in man she tells it all the time, by form, attitude, gesture, mien, face, and parts of the face, and by the whole action of the machine. The visible carriage or action of the individual, as resulting from its organization and his will, combined we call manners. What are they but thought entering the hands and feet, controlling the movements of the body, the speech, and behavior? There is always the best way of doing everything, if it be to boil an egg. Manners are the happy ways of doing things, each one a stroke of genius or of love, now repeated and hardened into usage. They form at last a rich varnish with which the routine of life is washed and its details adorned. If they are superficial, so are the dewdrops, which give such a depth to the morning meadows. Manners are very communicable. Men catch them from each other. Consuelo in the romance boasts of the lessons she had given to the nobles in manners on the stage. In real life, Tom will taught Napoleon the arts of behavior. Genius invents fine manners, which the baron and the baroness copy very fast, by the advantage of a palace, better the instruction. They stereotype the lessons they have learned into a mode. The power of manners is incessant, an element as unconcealable as fire. The nobility cannot in any country be disguised, and no more in a republic or a democracy than in a kingdom. No man can resist their influence. There are certain manners which are learned in good society, of that force that, if a man have them, he or she may be considered, and is everywhere welcome, though without beauty or wealth or genius. Give a boy a dress and accomplishments, and you give him the mastery of palaces and fortunes where he goes. He has not the trouble of earning or owning them. They solicit him to enter and possess. We send girls of a timid, retreating disposition to the boarding school, to the riding schools, to the ballroom, or wheresoever they can come into acquaintance with the nearness of leading persons of their own sex where they might learn a dress and see it near at hand. The power of a woman of fashion to lead, and also to daunt and repel, derives from their belief that she knows resources and behaviors not known to them, and when these have mastered her secret, they learn to confront her and recover their self-possession. Every day bears witness to their gentle rule. People who would obtrude now do not obtrude. The mediocre circle learns to demand that which belongs to a high state of nature or of culture. Your manners are always under examination, and by committees little suspected. A police and citizens close, but are awarding or denying you very high prizes when you least think it. We talk much of utilities, but tis our manners that associate us. In hours of business we go to him who knows, or has, or does this or that which we want, and we do not let our taste or feelings stand in the way. But this activity over, we return to our indolent state, and wish for those we can be at ease with. Those who will go where we go, whose manners do not offend us, whose social tone chimes with ours. We reflect on the persuasive and cheering force, how they recommend, prepare, and draw people together, how in all clubs manners make the members, how manners make the fortune of the ambitious youth, that, for the most part, his manners marry him, and, for the most part, he marries manners. We think what keys they are, and to what secrets, what high lessons and inspiring tokens of character they convey, and what divination is required in us for the reading of this fine telegraph, we see what range the subject has, and what relations to convenience, power, and beauty. Their first service is very low, when they are the minor morals, but tis the beginning of civility to make us, I mean, endurable to each other. We prize them for their rough plastic, abstergent force. We get people out of the quadruped stage, get them washed, clothed, and set up on end, to slough their animal husks and habits, 
Compel them to be clean, over all their spite and meanness. Teach them to stifle the base, and choose the generous expression, and make them know how much happier the generous behaviors are. Bad behavior the law cannot reach. Society is infested with rude, cynical, restless, and frivolous persons who prey upon the rest, and whom a public opinion concerned into good manners, forms accepted by the sense of all, can reach. The contradictors and railers at publics and private tables, who are like terriers, who conceive it the duty of a dog of honor to growl at any passer-by, and do the honors of the house by barking him out of sight. I have seen men who neigh like a horse when you contradict them, or say something which they do not understand. Then the overbold, who make their own invitation to your hearth, the persevering talker, who gives you his society in large, saturating doses, the pitiers of themselves, a perilous class, the frivolous Asmodeus, who relies on you to find him in ropes of sand to twist, the monotones, in short, every stripe of absurdity, these are social inflictions which the magistrate cannot cure or defend you from, and which must be entrusted to the restraining force of customs and proverbs, and familiar rules of behavior impressed on young people in their school days. In the hotels on the banks of the Mississippi they print, or used to print, among the rules of the house that no gentleman can be permitted to come to the public table without his coat. In the same country, in the pews of the churches, little placards plead with the worshippers against the fury of expectoration. Charles Dickens self-sacrificingly undertook the reformation of American manners in unspeakable particulars. I think the lesson was not quite lost, that it held bad manners up, so the churls could see the deformity. Unhappily, the book had its own deformities. It ought not to need to print in a reading room a caution of strangers not to speak loud, nor to persons who look over fine engravings that they should be handled like cobwebs and butterflies' wings, nor to persons who look at marble statues that they shall not smite them with canes. But even in the perfect civilization of this city, such cautions are not quite needless in the Athenaeum and city library. Manners are factitious and grow out of circumstances as well as out of character. If you look at the pictures of patricians and of peasants, at different periods and countries, you will see how well they match the same class in our towns. The modern aristocrat not only is well drawn in Titian's Venetian dodges, and in Roman coins and statues, but also in the pictures which Commodore Perry brought home of dignitaries in Japan. Broad lands and great interests not only arrive to such heads as can manage them, but form manners of power. A keen eye, too, will see nice gradations of rank, or see in the manners of the degree of homage the party is wont to receive. A prince who is accustomed every day to be courted and deferred to by the highest grandees acquires a corresponding expectation, and a becoming mode of receiving and replying to this homage. There are always exceptional people and modes. English grandees affect to be farmers. Clever House is a fop, and under the finish of dress, the levity of behavior hides the terror of his war. But nature and destiny are honest, and never fail to leave their mark, to hang out a sign for each and every quality. It is much to conquer one's face, and, and perhaps the ambitious youth thinks he got the whole secret when he has learned that disengaged manners are commanding. Don't be deceived by a facile exterior. Tender men sometimes have strong wills. We had in Massachusetts an old statesman who had sat all his life in courts and in chairs of state, without overcoming an extreme irritability of face, voice, and bearing. When he spoke, his voice would not serve him. It cracked, it broke, it wheezed, it piped. Little cared he. He knew that it had got to pipe or wheeze or, or screech his argument and his indignation. When he sat down after speaking, he seemed in a sort of fit, held on to his chair with both hands. But underneath all his irritability was a puissant will firm and advancing, and a memory in which lay an order and method like geologic strata, every fact of his history, and under the control of his will. Matters are partly factitious, but mainly, there must be capacity for culture in the blood. Else all culture is vain. The obstinate prejudice in favor of blood, which lies at the base of the feudal and monarchical fabrics of the old world, has some reason in common experience. Every man, mathematician, artist, soldier, and merchant, looks with confidence for some traits and talents in his own child which he would not dare to presume in the child of a stranger. The Orientalists are very orthodox on this point. Take a thorn bush, says the Amir Abdel Kader, and sprinkle it for a whole year with water. It will yield nothing but thorn. Take a date tree, leave it without culture, and it will always produce dates. Nobility is the date tree, and the Arab populace is a bush of thorns. A main fact in the history of manners is the wonderful expressiveness of the human body. If we were made of glass or of air, and the thoughts were written on steel tablets within, it could not publish more truly its meaning than now. Wise men read very sharply all your private history, and your look and gait and behavior. The whole economy of nature is bent on expression. The telltale body has all tongues. Men are like Geneva watches, with crystal faces which expose the whole movement. They carry the liqueur of life flowing up and down in those beautiful bottles, and announcing to the curious how it is with them. 
The face and eyes reveal that the spirit is doing, how old it is, what aims it has. The eyes indicate the antiquity of the soul, or through how many forms it has already ascended. It almost violates the proprieties, if we say above the breath here, that the confessing eye does not hesitate to utter to every street passenger. Man cannot fix his eye on the sun, and so far seems imperfect. In Siberia, a late traveler found men who could see the satellites of Jupiter with their unarmed eye. In some respects, the animals excel us. The birds have a longer sight, beside the advantage of their wings of a higher observatory. A cow can bid her calf, by secret signal, probably the eye, to run away, or to lie down and hide itself. The jockeys say of certain horses that they look over the whole ground. The outdoor life, the hunting, the labor, give equal vigor to the human eye. The farmer looks out at you as strong as a horse. His eye beam is like the stroke of a staff. An eye can threaten like a loaded and leveled gun, or can insult like hissing or kicking. Or, in its altered mood, by beams of kindness, it can make the heart dance with joy. The eye obeys exactly the action of the mind. When a thought strikes us, the eyes fix us, and remain gazing at a distance. In enumerating the names of persons or of countries, as France, Germany, Spain, Turkey, the eyes wink at each new name. There is no nicety of learning sought by the mind which the eyes do not vie in acquiring. An artist, said Michelangelo, must have his measuring tools not in the hand, but in the eye. There is no end to the catalogue of its performances, whether in indolent vision, that of the health and beauty, or in strained vision, that of art and labor. Eyes are bold as lions, roving, running, leaping, here and there, far and near. They speak all languages. They wait for no introduction. They are no Englishmen. Ask no leave of age or rank. They respect neither poverty nor riches, neither learning nor power, nor virtue, nor sex, but intrude and come again, and go through and through you in a moment of time. What inundation of life and thought is discharged from one soul into another through them? The glance is natural magic. The mysterious communication established across a house between two entire strangers moves all the springs of wonder. The communication by the glance is in the greatest part not subject to the control of the will. It is the bodily symbol of identity of nature. We look into the eyes to know if this other form is another self, and the eyes will not lie, but make a faithful confession what inhabitant is there. The revelations are sometimes terrific. The confession of a low, usurping devil is there made, and the observer shall seem to feel the stirring of owls and bats and horned hooves, where he looked for innocence and simplicity. It is remarkable, too, that the spirit that appears at the windows of the house does not at once invest himself a new form of his own to the mind of the beholder. The eyes of men converse as much as their tongues, with the advantage that the ocular dialect needs no dictionary, but is understood all the world over. When the eyes say one thing and the tongue another, a practiced man relies on the language of the first. If the man is off his center, the eyes show it. You can read in his eyes of your companion whether your argument hits him, though his tongue will not confess it. There is a look by which a man shows he is going to say a good thing, and a look when he has said it. Vain and forgotten are all the fine offers and offices of hospitality, if there is no holiday in the eye. How many furtive inclinations avowed by the eye, though dissembled by the lips. One comes away from a company in which, it may easily happen, he has said nothing, and no important remark has been addressed to him, and yet, if in sympathy with the society, he shall not have a sense of this fact, such a stream of life has been flowing into him, not from him through the eyes. There are eyes, to be sure, that give no admission into the man than blueberries. Others are liquid and deep, wells that a man might fall into. Others are aggressive and devouring, seem to call out to the police, take all too much notice, and, and require crowded broadways, and the security of millions to protect individuals against them. The military eye I meet, now darkly sparkling under clerical and under rustic brows. Tis a city of Lacedaemon, tis a stack of bayonets. There are asking eyes, asserting eyes, prowling eyes, the eyes full of fate, some of good, some of sinister omen. The alleged power to charm down insanity, or ferocity and beast, is a power behind the eye. It must be a victory achieved in the will, before it can be signified in the eye. It is very certain that each man carries in his eye the exact indication of his rank and the immense scale of men. We are always learning to read it. A complete man should need no auxiliaries to his personal presence. Whoever looked on him would consent to his will, being certified that his aims were generous and universal. The reason why men do not obey us is because they see the mud at the bottom of our eye. If the organ of sight is such a vehicle of power, the other features have their own. A man finds room in the few square inches of the face for the traits of all his ancestors, for the expression of all his history and his wants. The sculptor and Wickelman and Lavater will tell you how significant a feature is the nose, how its forms express strength or weakness of will and good or bad temper. 
The notes of Julius Caesar of Dante of Pitt suggest the terror of the beak, what refinement and what limitations the teeth betray. Beware you don't laugh, said the wise mother, for then you show all your faults. Baljac left in manuscript a chapter which he called Theory de la Démarche, in which he says the look, the voice, the respiration, and the attitude or walk are identical. But as it has not been given to man the power to stand guard at once over these four different simultaneous expressions of his thought, watch that one which speaks out the truth, and you will know the whole man. Palaces interest us mainly in the exhibition of manners, which, in the idle and expansive society dwelling in them, are raised to a high art. The maxim, of course, is the manner is power. A calm and resolute bearing, a polished speech, an embellishment of trifles, and the art of hiding all uncomfortable feeling are essential to the courtier. In St. Simon, and Cardinal de Retz, and Rutterer, and an encyclopedia of memoirs will instruct you, if you wish, in these potent secrets. Thus it is a point of pride with kings to remember faces and names. It is reported of one prince that his head had the air of leaning downwards, in order not to humble the crowd. There are people who come in ever like a child with a piece of good news. It was said of the late Lord Holland that he always came down to breakfast with the air of a man who had just met with some signal good fortune. In Notre Dame, the grandee took his place in the dais with the look of one who was thinking of something else, but we must not peep and eavesdrop at palace doors. Fine manners need the support of fine manners in others. A scholar may be a well-bred man, or he may not. The enthusiast is introduced to polished scholars in society, and is chilled in silence by finding himself not in their element. They all have somewhat which he has not, and it seems, ought to have. But if he finds a scholar apart from his companions, it is then the enthusiast's turn, and the scholar has no defense, but must deal on his terms. Now they must fight the battle out on their private strengths. What is the talent of that character so common, the successful man of the world, in all of marts, senates, and drawing-rooms, Manners, manners of power, sense to see his advantage, and manners up to it. See him approach his man. He knows the troops behave as they are handled at first. That is a cheap secret. Just what happens to every two persons who meet on any affair. One instantly perceives that he has the key to the situation, that his will comprehends the other's will, as the cat does the mouse, and he has only to use courtesy and furnish good-natured reasons to his victim to cover up his chain, lest he be shamed into resistance. The theatre in which the science of manners is a formal importance is not with us a court, but dress circles, wherein, after the close of the day's business, men and women meet at leisure for mutual entertainment in ornamental drawing-rooms. Of course, there is every variety of attraction and merit, but to earnest persons, to youths or maidens, who have great object at heart, we can extol it highly. A well-dressed, talkative company, where each is bent to amuse the other, yet the high-born Turk who came hither fancied that every woman seemed to be suffering for a chair that all the talkers were brained and exhausted by the deoxygenated air. It spoiled the best persons, it put all on stilts. Yet here are the secret biographies written in red. The aspect of that man is repulsive, I do not wish to deal with him. The other is irritable, shy, and on his guard. The youth looks humble and manly, I choose him. Look on this woman, there is not beauty, nor brilliant sayings, nor distinguished power to serve you, but all see her gladly, her whole air and impression are healthful. Here comes the sentimentalists and the invalids. Here is Elise, who caught cold coming in the world, and has always increased it since. There are creep mouse manners, and thievish manners. Look at Northcote, said Fuseli. He looks like a rat who has seen a cat. In the shallow company, easily excited, easily tired, here is the columnar Bernard. The Alleghanies do not express more repose than his behavior. Here are the sweet following eyes of Cecile. It seems always that she demanded the heart. Nothing can be more excellent and kind than the Corinthian grace of Gertrude's manners, and yet Blanche who has no manners, has better manners than she, where the movements of Blanche are the sallies of his spirit, which is sufficient for the moment, and she can afford to express every thought by instant action. Manners have been somewhat cynically defined as a contrivance of wise men to keep fools at a distance. Fashion is shrewd to detect those who do not belong to her train, and seldom waste her attentions. Society is very swift in its instincts, and, if you do not belong to it, resistance sneers at you, or quietly drops you. The first weapon enrages the party attacked, the second is still more effective, but is not to be resisted, as the date of the transaction is not easily found. People grow up and grow old under this infliction, and never suspect the truth, ascribing the solitude which acts on them very injuriously to any cause but the right one. The basis of good manners is self-reliance. Necessity is a law of all who are not self-possessed. Those who are not self-possessed obtrude and pain us. Some men appear to feel that they belong to a pariah class. They fear to offend, they bend and apologize, and walk through life with a timid step. As we sometimes dream that we are in a well-dressed company without any coat, so Godfrey acts ever as if he suffered from some mortifying circumstance. 
The hero should find himself at home wherever he is, should impart comfort by his own security and good nature to all beholders. The hero is suffered to be himself. A person of strong mind comes to perceive that for him an immunity is secured so long as he renders to society that service which is native and proper to him, an immunity from all the observances, yea, and duties, which society so tyrannically imposes on the rank and file of its members. Euripides, says Aspasia, has not the fine manners of Sophocles, but, she adds good-humoredly, the movers and masters of our soul have surely a right to throw out their limbs as carelessly as they please, on the world that belongs to them, and therefore the creatures they have animated. Manners require time, as nothing is more vulgar than haste. Friendship should be surrounded with ceremonies and respects, and not crushed into corners. Friendship requires more time than poor busy men can usually command. Here comes to me Roland, with a delicacy of sentiment, leading and wrapping him like a divine cloud or holy ghost. It is a great destitution to both that this should not be entertained with large leisures, but contrary should be balked by importune affairs. But through this lustrous varnish, the reality is ever shrinking. It is hard to keep the what from breaking through this pretty painting of the how. The core will come to the surface. Strong will and keen perception overpower old manners and create new. The thought of the present moment has a greater value than all the past. In persons of character, we do not remark manners because of their instantaneousness. We are surprised by the thing done, out of all power to watch the way of it. And nothing is more charming than to recognize the great style that which runs through the actions of such. People masquerade before us in their fortunes, titles, offices, and connections as economic and civil presidents, or senators, or professors, or great lawyers, and impose on us the frivolous and a good deal on each other by these fames. At least it is a point of prudent good manners to treat these reputations tenderly, as if they were merited. But the sad realist knows these fellows at a glance, and they know him. As when in Paris the chief of the police enters a ballroom, so many diamond pretenders shrink and make themselves as inconspicuous as they can, or give him a supplicating look as they pass. I had received, said a Sibyl, I had received at birth the fatal gift of penetration, and these Cassandras are always born. Manners impress as they indicate real power. A man who is sure of his point carries a broad, contented expression, which everybody reads. And you cannot rightly train one to an air and manner except by making him the kind of man of whom the manner is the natural expression. Nature forever puts a premium on reality. What is done for effect is seen to be done for effect. What is done for love is felt to be done for love. A man inspires affection and honor because he was not lying in wait for these. The things of a man for which we visit him were done in the dark and in the cold. A little integrity is better than any career. So deep are the sources of this surface action that even the size of your companion seems to vary with his freedom of thought. Not only is he larger when at ease, and his thoughts generous, but everything around him becomes variable with expression. No carpenter's rule, no rod and chain will measure the dimensions of any house or house lot. Go into the house. If the proprietor is constrained and deferring, it is of no importance how large his house, how beautiful his grounds. You quickly come to the end of it all. But if the man is self-possessed and happy, and at home, his house is deep-founded, indefinitely large and interesting the roof and dome buoyant as the sky. Under the humblest roof, the commonest person in plain clothes sits there massive, cheerful, yet formidable like the Egyptian colossi. Neither Aristotle, nor Leibniz, nor Junius, nor Champollion has set down the grammar rules of this dialect, older than Sanskrit, but they who cannot yet read English can read this. Men take each other's measure when they meet for the first time, and every time they meet. How do they get this rapid knowledge, even before they speak, of each other's power and dispositions? One would say that the persuasion of their speech is not in what they say, or that men do not convince by their argument, but by their personality, by who they are, and what they said and did with heretofore. A man already strong is listened to, and everything he says is applauded. Another opposes him with sound argument, but the argument is scouted, until by and by it gets into the mind of some weighty person, then it begins to tell on the community. Self-reliance is the basis of behavior, as it is the guarantee that the powers are not squandered in too much demonstration. In this country, where school education is universal, we have a superficial culture and a profusion of reading and writing and expression. We parade our nobilities in poems and orations, instead of working them up into happiness. There is a whisper out of the ages to him who can understand it. Whatever is known to thyself alone has always very great value. There is some reason to believe that, when a man does not write his poetry, it escapes by other vents through him, instead of the one vent of writing, clings to its forms and manners, whilst poets often have nothing poetical about them except their verses. Jacobi said that when a man has fully expressed his thought, he has somewhat less possession of it. One would say the rule is this, 
What a man has irresistibly urged to say helps him and us. In explaining his thought to others, he explains it to himself, but when he opens it for show, it corrupts him. Society is the stage in which manners are shown. Novels are their literature. Novels are the journal or record of manners, and the new importance of these books derives from the fact that the novelist begins to penetrate the surface and treat this part of life more worthily. The novels used to be all alike and had a quite vulgar tone. The novels used to lead us on to a foolish interest in the fortunes of the boy and the girl they described. The boy was to be raised from a humble to a high position. He was in want of a wife and a castle, and the object of the story was to supply him with one or of both. We watched sympathetically, step by step, his climbing until, at the last, the point is gained, the wedding day is fixed, and follow the gala procession home to the castle, when the doors are slammed in our face and the poor reader is left outside in the cold, not enriched by so much as an idea or a virtuous impulse. But the victories of the characters are instant, and victories for all, its greatness enlarges all. We are fortified by every heroic anecdote. The novels are as useful as Bibles, if they teach you the secret, that the best of life is conversation, and the greatest success is confidence, or perfect understanding between sincere people. This is a French definition of friendship. Roqua centra, good understanding. The highest compact we can make with our fellow is, let there be truth between us two forevermore. That is the charm of all good novels, that is the charm of all good histories. The heroes mutually understand from the first, and deal loyally, and with a profound trust in each other. It is sublime to feel and say of another, I need never meet or speak or write to him. We need not reinforce ourselves or send tokens of remembrance. I rely on him as on myself. If he did thus or thus, I know it was right. In all the superior people I have met, I noticed directness, truth spoken more truly, as if everything of obstruction, of malformation, had been trained away. What have they to conceal? What have they to exhibit? Between simple and noble persons, there is always a quick intelligence. They recognize at sight, and meet on a better ground than the talent and skills they may chance to possess, namely on sincerity and uprightness. For it is not what talents or genius a man has, but how he is to his talents, that constitute friendship and character. The man that stands by himself, the universe stands by him also. It is related of the monk Basil. Being excommunicated by the Pope, he was, at his death, sent in charge of an angel to find a fit place of suffering in hell. But such was the eloquence and good humor of the monk, that whenever he went he was received gladly, and civilly treated, even by the most uncivil angels. When he came to discourse with them, instead of contradicting or forcing him, they took his part and adopted his manners, and even good angels came from afar to see him, and take up their abode with him. The angel that was sent to find a place to of torment for him attempted to remove him to a worse pit, but with no better success. For such was the contented spirit of the monk, that he found something to praise in every place and company, though in hell, and made a kind of heaven of it. At last the escorting angel returned with his prisoner to them that sent him, saying that no phlegathon could be found who would burn him. For that, in whatever condition, Basil remained incorrigibly Basil. The legend says his sentence was remitted, that he was allowed to go into heaven, and was canonized a saint. There was a stroke of magnanimity in the correspondence of Bonaparte with his brother Joseph, when the latter was king of Spain, and complained that he missed in Napoleon's letters the affectionate tone which had marked his childish correspondence. I'm sorry, replied Napoleon, you think you shall find your brother again only in the Elysian fields. It is natural that at forty he should not feel towards you as he did at twelve, but his feelings towards you have greater truth and strength, his friendship has the features of his mind. How much we forgive to those who yield us the rarest spectacle of heroic manners. We will pardon them the want of books, of arts, and even of the gentler virtues. How tenaciously we remember them. Here is a lesson which I brought along with me in boyhood from the Latin school, and which ranks with the best of Roman anecdotes. Marcus Scorus was accused by Quintus Varius Hispanus, and he was excited the allies to take arms against the Republic, but he, full of firmness and gravity, defended himself in this manner. Quintus Varius Hispanus alleges that Marcus Scorus, president of the Senate, excited the allies to arms. Marcus Scorius, president of the Senate, denies it. There is no witness. Which do you believe, Romans? O tri creditas caritas? When he had said these words, he was absolved by the assembly of the people. I have seen manners that make a similar impression with personal beauty. They give the likes exhilaration and redefine us like that. And in memorable experiences, they are suddenly better than beauty and make that superfluous and ugly. But they must be marked by fine perception, the acquaintance with real beauty. They must always show self-control. You shall not be facile, apologetic or leaky, but keen over your word, and every gesture and action shall indicate power at rest. But then they must be inspired by the good heart. There is no beautifier of complexion, or form, or behavior, like the wish to scatter joy and not pain around us. 
tis good to give a stranger a meal or a night's lodging tis better to be hospitable to his good meaning and thought and give courage to a companion we must be as courteous to a man as we are to a picture which we are willing to give the advantage of good light special precepts are not to be thought of the talent of well-doing contains them all every hour will show you a duty as paramount as that of my whim just now and i will write it and there is one topic peremptorily forbidden to all well-bred to all rational mortals namely the distempers if you have not slept or if you have slept or if you have headache or sciatica or leprosy or thunderstroke i beseech you by all angels to hold your peace and do not flute the morning to which the housemates bring serene and pleasant thoughts by corruptions and groans come out of the azure love the day do not leave the sky out of your landscape the oldest and most deserving person should come very modestly into any newly awakened company respecting the divine communications out of which all must be presumed to have newly come the old man who added an elevating culture to our large experience of life said to me when you come into the room i think i will study how to make humanity beautiful to you as respects the delicate question of culture i do not think that any other than negative rules can be laid down for positive rules for suggestion nature alone inspires it who dare assume a guide of youth a maid to perfect manners the golden mean is still delicate difficult say frankly unattainable what finest hands would not be clumsy to sketch the genial precepts of the young girl's demeanor the chances seem infinite against success and yet success is continually attained there must not be secondariness and tis a thousand to one that her air and manners will at once betray that she is not primary and that there is some other one or many of her class to whom she habitually postpones herself but nature lifts her easily and without knowing it over these impossibilities and we are continually surprised with graces and felicities not only unteachable but undescribable end of behavior recording by daniel christopher june you can visit my website at www.perfectidius.com. That's perfect, I-D-I-U-S.com.